On behalf of the Ranchers Stewardship Alliance, I want to say welcome to the third of our Rural Resilience Series here for 2023. We've got one more coming up that's going to be in April, where we're going to be doing Picture This. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on here in this webinar. But we've had two previous webinar series, one dealing with carbon and uh, the other one dealing with buying cattle in a drought situation and what you should be looking for. You can head to our RSA YouTube channel and get all of the information on those ones if you want to do a replay on those. So a little background on who RSA is. I am the communications and outreach lead with this rancher funded nonprofit and uh, Angel DeVries is with us and she's serving as tech support tonight. She is our executive director. RSA was founded in 2003, a desire to keep the grasslands of the Northern Great Plains intact and its producers flourishing kind of the, the root structure to why 30 plus ranching families joined together to form RSA. Pressures from outside interests, transition planning and the stressors of ranching in an arid isolated region were too much to handle alone. A legacy of wise land stewardship is the reason the grasslands remain intact. The Rancher Stewardship Alliance is a 501c3 nonprofit. Now we are headquartered in North Central Montana, Malta is our home base with the mission of ranching, conservation, and communities, a winning team. Now, of course, an open, healthy prairie is good for the rancher. It's also good for wildlife. And recognizing that relationship, RSA has been able to create some pretty extraordinary partnerships with wildlife groups. As a direct result, collaborative conservations have taken place. We're always learning which is which we're always learning, which is where tonight comes into play. And uh, as we continue our Rural Resilience webinar series, it's held again through April. The final discussion is going to be focusing on seeing the impact that you are having on your own land by using photo monitoring. One of our board members will be joining us for that one in April. If you're here for this event, you are on the email list that had the reminder. And uh, when we get closer to that event that's coming up in April, we'll give you another reminder for that one. So. As we get ready to welcome in tonight's speakers, I want to remind you that it is an interactive event. About halfway through our hour tonight, we're going to have the opportunity to break out into some groups and discuss two questions that Ivan is going to be posing to the audience. <clears throat> so now our main event, Ivan Thrain and his wife manage a weed grazing herd of goats in and around Red Lodge, Montana. <clears throat> In 2008, Ivan was gifted a portion of the family ranch land from his grandmother and encountered a land base dominated by knapweed. Now, he dreamed of making a living in agriculture, but knew that something had to change with their approach to land management. The change would be an opportunity to learn and try something different. After studying holistic resource management and discovering how much goats relish knapweed and other noxious weeds, Ivan and his wife started small with nine goats and eventually built a herd of over 500 head, which they manage using principles of rotational grazing. Through their grazing service business, Healthy Meadows LLC, they work with both public and private landowners and move with their three children, their herd of goats, and at times sheep, and their working dogs all over the south central part of Montana. Montana. From swimming goats to an island on the Clark's Fork River to trailing them hundreds of miles on hoof and foot, Ivan has learned a lot about small ruminants, the plants they like to eat, and the stories the land has to tell. Ladies and gentlemen, Ivan Thrain. Yeah, hello everybody. Thank, thank you, Haley, um, for the introduction. And yeah, I just want to thank you. Angel too for they contacted me way back in the fall and here we are now um, so yeah really really grateful to be able to participate in this and share a little story and I think Angel is going to pull up my PowerPoint presentation okay hopefully every can everyone see that looking good okay um, yeah, so, so like Haley said um, in the beginning, um, this, so the, this is a picture of the place that uh, my grandmother gifted, gifted me back in 2008. And originally it was my great grandparents place. Um, and you can, as you can see in this picture, I have a, I have an arrow. There's a blue arrow pointing at, at a this is an alfalfa field in this picture. This picture is from like the early, early 60s. 
And in the back in the horizon, there's a there's a yellow, little more yellowish field that that's oats. And so this this field in particular, where this blue arrow is pointing, is what started us on the journey with goats. By the by the time my my great grandfather died in the in the in the seventies, and this field, you know, it was no longer being farmed, and it turned into a cow pasture. And then it was over the next couple next few decades, it was just maintained as a as just as a cow pasture. Um, set stock rate. It was leased to a neighbor, and so it was grazed, you know, continuously every every summer. And o- over time, by the time I um, took over, it it was it was pretty much a solid field of uh, knapweed and uh, Japanese broom. And at that time, the county the county was contacting me about how how I was going to address this field because in our county in Carbon County the the weed district is pretty, pretty on top of weeds. They um, they kind of go all over the place looking at land and different weeds. And this field in particular was pretty solid purple come August. And so I'm I'm sh- I'm just sharing this in in light of um, every piece of land in this state has a history. And some some land we don't we don't really even know what what the farming history is, what the grazing history is. And so what I'm what we've been learning is these plants help kind of explain the story a little bit. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So so here's you know here's a picture of one of us, some of our first goats, and I I, I circled the the purple um, the purple knabweed flower, and you can see on the left there's a there's there's a little closer view of the of of the of the field and how saturated that that knapweed was, and um, I, I raised goats as a kid in 4-H and I I knew how much they relish, you know relish flowers and and browse, and for anybody that's raised goats, I mean it's it's a pretty amazing um, attribute they have where they all they'll go running to a field like this and start eating all the flowers, and so we, you know, we had heard about other other people um, using using goats for for weed control in uh, Wyoming, California, Idaho, um, and so as the county was was trying to help us, you know, figure out what what the heck are we going to do? I I, did, I I told them that we wanted to start trying to graze with goats, and so we started with nine nine goats and started breeding them, and twenty five, and then a hundred, and the herd, the herd was growing, and what we quickly realized there's a huge difference between having, you know, nine, ten, twenty goats and a hundred goats. Once we got to about a hundred goats, there, they, we started calling them the the ravenous herd or horde because they just they come in like locusts and just start eating everything in sight. And so with that became the reality of how do you how do you manage these animals? And as I as I have on the bottom the screen here, um, just kind of posing this question that we'll come back to um, of, will there be a time when these weeds help us through hard times? And um, I'll share a story from one of my neighbors about that. So we go to the next slide. So I, I, re- I really like going back on some of the history because I think the history helps us understand where we are right now. And what I what I found fascinating, digging a little deeper into the goats, uh, is is that they're considered one of the first animals that were domesticated, and they were they were domesticated they they say around ten to eleven thousand years ago in what is now like Iran, and around that same time, ag- agriculture supposedly was starting in the Fertile Crescent. We learned about this a little bit in school if you if you studied a agri- little bit of agricultural history and what what i what struck me just in this so this is a some old rock art on the top that's a technically be the ancestor of the domesticated goat which is an ibex and what's really the ibex can have huge horns that they really arch and go way out our our modern domesticated goats don't necessarily typically have horns that get that big but it really struck me just just that shape just reminded me of like what I what I imagine the Fertile Crescent would look like, you know, from a satellite imagery. 
and and this and then this this rock art um this painting is from a, a cave in france that's you know they say is thirteen thousand years old and so i'm I like just to share this and, you know, we're, we're talking, if anybody has, you know, ancestry from, from Europe at some, at some phase in our, you know, our lineage, we, we probably had somebody that was looking to the, looking to the goat or the Ibex as a food source um, for milk, for, for leather, for hides. And, and so, and, and, and at the same time that agriculture is developing, um, goats were, were part of, part of that, that transition. So we can go to the next slide. And so this is a painting, this is like a painting of um, Utsi. So what I, what I found fascinating is he's, he's like the oldest, oldest man that was ever found fully intact. So there was two hikers up in the Austrian Italian Alps and they, they found this, this man that was frozen, that was frozen and, and the snow was melting and he had an arrow in his back. And they thought he was, they thought he had been murdered. What they didn't know was how old he was till they started chipping him out of the ice and, and studying him. And he's, they claim he's probably one of the most studied human beings ever. And just to put some time frame on here, this he was they, they figured out he's from about five thousand years ago during like the Copper Age in Europe. So that's just to put it in perspective, that's a thousand years before the pyramids in Giza were built, and that's like they say like three hundred years before the wheel was ever invented. So this this is this is way back. Um, but what what they what they found what I found was fascinating was like his all his clothing, um, his leggings and stuff were made out of goat skin. And they were able to find in his stomach that he had half, half a kilo of goat meat. So that's like just over a pound of goat meat. So I, I, I like to sh share that in the sense of he, he had an arrow on his back. And so what I, what I imagine is he, he either stole some, some meat from, you know, some campfire that goat meat was so valuable. He was willing to die for it. Um, so, but they've, they've studied him a lot and it's just interesting, just that, again, that early history of our relationship with goats. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so we're, I'm going to, I'm going to return back to our place. Um, so some, some of the attributes of, of goats that still like that, that was thousands of years ago, they were known for. Um, you know, specifically for for being able to survive in um, rugged places. This 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 picture, our field is not necessarily rugged, but I I would say an attribute that they have that differentiates them from other domesticated animals is their their ability to eat weeds um, and and specifically some weeds that are poisonous to um, all other classes of livestock like poison hemlock, larkspur. Um, di different plants that that would that can kill horses and cows and even sheep. Um, but so here's this is a picture in 2013. We have around around 200 goats that we're starting to really rotationally graze in this field. And I'm going to sh start showing you start what what's what occurs over time. So we can go to the next slide. So this this is just the. I, I, you know, I look back and I wish I had, I had taken even more pictures than I did, but this picture in the top left is in 2009. And this is, you know, how, how sparse the, the field was in some portions, like the napweed was even like stunted. And, and then in, in two, this is 2019. I'm just, I'm showing you just the grass, the grass and, and this, the alfalfa, I'm going to show you more that started coming back. So we can go to the next slide. And like I mentioned earlier, we were, you know, we were early on just really studying, um, just trying to learn some of the concepts from Alan Savory, Holistic Resource Management. And I, I think the one that really struck me the most that probably some of you already have already been exposed to is like this image right here of this fescue grass. Um, and you know the grass on the left is continually grazed, so it's just grazed nonstop, and the roots are just super tiny. Then you've 
then you got you know the, the fescue grass recovering so its roots are going down and then you have the fully recovered and the roots are you know as as big as the above ground growth or even more and so what i find really fascinating about alfalfa and even knapweed is they claim the roots go down up over 25 feet down into the earth and so it's 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 almost hard to imagine imagine that um but so with this concept of trying to thoroughly heavily graze and trample this these knapweed fields we also um we also incorporated some rest and in, in one situation because we were we were wintering on um different ranches over the years we we rested that field for upwards of two years and it helped build up help build up litter and and thatch that when we came back was able to create soil cover or soil armor as they call it um and and in certain areas responded way better than others like we still have some real south facing slopes that are very erodible um that are that we're still working on but we've we've got some areas that have just it's kind of been like a miracle for us and i like i mentioned the just the art of herding the art of managing goats is a is a huge part of the education of using these animals to graze because they they have a reputation for m many things and one of them we found is just their tenacity and trying to get out of fence and escape and and roam next slide so this this is the the same the, the same little slope where that picture from 2000, 2009 was with the goats laying in the knapweed. And as you can see here, we've got, um, I mean, this, 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 was, this to us was really incredible. The, the, the knapweed, the knapweed was diminishing and the, alf, the alfalfa was starting to return. And, and that alfalfa had been, that seed had been laying dormant probably since, probably since the eighties. Um, the pasture had been had been sprayed, you know, on and off through the '90s um, to try to control the knapweed, and it it really it really proved to us this this concept that we'd heard that that seeds lay dormant in the soil till the conditions are right for you know in which for them to grow, and you know we also have a lot of smooth brome, which some people don't like, but we found it it's. It, we find it's it's a good grass for you know its ability to create soil cover and for grazing. And I'm, and I'm, as I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a little timeline and some some more of the story. So we can go to the next slide. So this is a picture of the same field with with uh, my wife and our youngest son. And I, I just have that just to show the the height of this of the of this grass and alfalfa. And and so, you know, in 2010, kind of go ahead from 2010 to two, 2018, to, or, you know, to present, um, you know, we, you know, we started rotationally grazing with these hundred goats. It was, you know, by 2013, it was still predominantly knapweed. Then 2014 and 15, we fully rested it. 2016, we started seeing more, you know, more of this alfalfa returning. And then by 2017, we were seeing areas where this the alfalfa from the grass was out competing the knapweed, and and so I just I just like to share this story specifically because for us this was this was this was kind of this is what gave us hope to try to use goats for grazing weeds, and I also want to emphasize that every piece of land is 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 different, and so. This story I'm sharing with our place is very specific to the conditions, the soil, the slope, um, the history of that land. Um, but I like to use it as an example of if given if given the chance, land can can change um, and become highly productive. Next slide. Um, here's here's just a close up view of when I when I said we had. I was saying we, we we've counted upwards of seven different colors of alfalfa, and so what I've what I've been learning is that they've actually been cross pollinating, and and mutating and changing, and and so you know that like as every farmer knows, I mean it's it it it, it can be really it can be really uplifting when you see a a plant or a crop that that you enjoy um, showing all of its beauty and all of its colors, and so. To us, this has just been really, 
yeah, it's just been giving us a lot of hope. Um, next slide. So I, I mentioned, I had raised this question a little earlier of, you know, will there be a time when these weeds are going to help us? And I've shared this story before, but I, I really think it's profound. We have a, we have a neighbor who's, uh, he's a fourth generation rancher in our, in our area. And he tells a story of back in the twenties. Um, it, it, it coincided with the great depression. The, the Mormon crickets and the grasshoppers were, 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 were so abundant that they were stripping all, all the crops, all the alfalfa. And one of the few plants that was still green and vibrant and growing was the, the Canadian thistle. And so the story is, it's actually from his, it's, it's from his, his wife's side of the family. Um, but the, the, the grandfather ended up having to take, take over this ranch when his father died and he was young, he, they were 10 or 12 and um, they decided to go around and they, they took scythes and they went around and they cut this thistle by hand and then they put laid salt on it and stacked it and they put it up in their barn. And then they brought in, they brought in, they, they raised short pole Hereford cows back, back in the day, they were crosses and they brought them into a corral and they started calling out all the wild ones. They started selling them off. And then they kept the ones that were more docile and then they started milking them and they, they, they were too poor to buy alfalfa hay. And so they started feeding these cows this thistle. And what they, what, what they knew and what they found was they were able to keep these cows in good milk production through the winter. And so they were able to sell the cream. And so I like to share this story of, because this is before internet, this is before there was even very many books, but they had the awareness to know that there was something about this thistle that was nutritious. And if they fed it to their cows, they, they, could, they could get these cows to, to keep in milk production. And so I, I, wanna, I, just, I just wanna share that and the fact that I think, I think today we just, it's, we too readily available, you know, alfalfa, grain, you know, cake, it's, it's so readily available, but when you don't have that, what do you do? And sometimes these weeds are the only thing that are green and growing during a drought year. So next slide. And so we, we worked, and some of you may have know or heard of Nicole Masters. We started working with Nicole Masters on some of the properties that we graze. And we were just trying to understand like what is going on with these plants. Um, and so we did some forage tests on, we've done an array of different plants. And I just, I'm just highlighting two, two plants in particular here with the Western wheatgrass and the Canadian thistle. So the Western wheatgrass is native and the Canadian thistle isn't. Um, but when I mentioned earlier, like the, the ability to produce milk in a cow, if you look at the calcium in the Western wheatgrass, I have it highlighted here, it's you know, 0.447, but then you look at the calcium in the Canadian thistle and it's you know, more than triple. Um, but you, as you go down like the, the manganese um, there's a difference, you know, the Canadian thistle has more sulfur, zinc, the Canadian thistle has more, but then you go to iron and that, the Western wheatgrass has a little bit more iron and has more manganese, but then the copper again, um, the Canadian thistle has almost double. And so what, 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 we've, what we've really learned ultimately is the importance in plant diversity and kind of highlighting some of, you know, Fred Provenza's work um, with animal behavior in the U University of Utah um, that animals will self-select for their needs. And so goats in particular, they'll, 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 go, they'll go right for that Canadian thistle because they crave all these extra minerals. Goats, goats have higher copper requirements than other animals. If, as a lot of people learn, if you ever have to buy mineral, they usually recommend more copper for for goats in particular um but i think again the western wheatgrass is still important because there's you know there's an importance in having the roughage and balancing some some of the things and the fact that it has more iron and manganese um you know and so some of this is a mystery other than why like the canadian thistle has a lot deeper root structure than the western wheatgrass i mean we're talking over 25 feet deep so it's drawing up these minerals from way below and then making them available 
to the above surface. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna I'm kind of gonna touch touch on this a little more because uh, over the years I've you know as strange as it sounds we've come to admire these these so-called noxious weeds. Next slide. Um, so right here, you know, I said, what did we learn from the napweed and alfalfa? Just to kind of sum that up. Um, ultimately, like Mother Nature wants, Mother Nature wants flowers, pollinators, and grazers. And so we, we, we've really learned that in a healthy ecosystem, there should be something blooming every month of the growing season. And that, that only occurs when you have diversity when you have different plants, because as, as, as you know, like for some of the frustrating weeds that, that we get calls about that, like for instance, dandelion is like one of the first ones that bloom, right? And then we we're just talking about knapweed and knapweed doesn't bloom till August. So, so from a pollinator standpoint, that's awesome because they've got all these this different flowers coming along. Um, you know, this other concept is there's more going underground than we can see. Um, that, that was what I was hinting upon is, I mean, it's really hard to imagine roots going down 25, 50 feet deep. Um, I mean, that's, to me, that's like unfathomable to try to dig, dig a hole that deep to see, see how, what, what they're tapping into. And, and then something that was really interesting for us is we, um, yeah, we actually worked with Patty Armbrester, who has saw us on this, this call. And um, we also, um, we, we sent some, some tests into it's, they're called earth Fort. Uh, they do a biology, they do biology soil tests out of Oregon. And what, what was really dumbfounding to me was we, we took, we took some soil samples from a, a still predominantly napweed patch on a slope. And we found that it was fungally dominated. And that was the opposite of what I thought. I thought it was going to be bacterially dominated because from what everything we've learned, you know, bacterially dominated soils or weedy soils, but this was fungally dominated. And what we've learned with alfalfa is that it can establish, you know, a double symbiosis with nitrogen fixing bacteria and, you know, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So alfalfa is at this next stage of like, it's more balanced. Um, but then there was a study that I, I actually contacted one of the research, uh, research professors in Missoula that, that helped co-wrote this, this study. And this was put out in 2013, but the, the, you know, the title is severe plant invasions can increase mycorrhizal fungi abundance and diversity. And this is just like a little quote from the beginning of that study that they say, we show that invasions by knapweed and leafy spurge, uh, but not cheatgrass support a higher abundance and diversity of symbiotic arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi than multi-species native plant communities. And, and so just to explain this a little more, mycorrhizal fungi is like the more we're learning about it, um, it's, it's kind of the hot topic in soil health um, and understanding biology is mycorrhizal fungi is extending the root network of plants and a lot like, like gathering more and more minerals and nutrients and feeding them to the plant in exchange for carbon sugars. And so what, what they kind of concluded in this study was the knapweed is actually, what they're learning is that they actually think it's part of the healing process of the land. And th it just happens to be that on the, on, the, on the surface level, we just see this monoculture of knapweed, but in the, underneath there's, there's all this exchanging going on. And, and so I, I, I just share that in a sense of, I don't, you know, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I've, I've really grown to just have an appreciation for the mystery of what mother nature is doing and what these plants are doing. And ultimately, you know, we're in the business of, of like managing animals that graze plants and specifically weeds. And so it happens to be these, these weeds are, are doing a, a lot more than just just being a nuisance. Um, thanks. Next. No, oh yeah. Next slide. And this is this is another topic that that I really really kind of gotten frustrated with over the over the years of of grazing weeds is this concept of native versus non-native. Um, I just have I just have a list here of you know these these are all some of the you know plants that we 
that we grow or we, um, you know, we've, we've come to think of as beneficial or important, you know, alfalfa, clover, birds for tree foil, plantain, smooth brome, grass, orchard grass, timothy grass, lentils, wheat, barley, they're all non-native. Um, but we've, we, we, we grow, a lot of us grow them and we, we think they're, we think they're more beneficial. Um, but then, you know, you have a, you have a picture here of this, this goldfinch. Um, I have that, my, you know, my grandmother's favorite bird was a goldfinch. And so there was always, there was always a goldfinch flitting, or, flitting around the house or in the lilac bushes. And so I've, you know, as I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate them. And so something I noticed was they go, they land on these, this thistle, you know, Canadian thistle, bull thistle, elk thistle, and they, um, they'll gather these seeds. And so I was looking up one day and I, I learned that they, um, they, they time their breeding, their nest building, and when they have their eggs for when, th when thistle is in full bloom. And they take spider web and thistle down and they build their nest. And so this is a native bird that has created, you know, almost a symbiotic relationship with this non-native plant. And so I think, I think there's a lot we can learn from, from these relationships of how, how can we find a use for these, these weeds um, that, is, that is beneficial for us. And then I, I have this picture of, um, you know, a cow eating. This is a bull thistle. I mean, a, this is a heifer calf. And we, we also, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this. We do a little multi-species. We raise a few cows. Um, some of the work that Kathy Voth has done with land, livestock for landscapes, it, I mean, she's all about teaching and helping other people's like train and learn how to get your cows to eat weeds. And so I like to emphasize that it, it doesn't always have to be goats. Goats just naturally have the ability to want to eat these weeds, but cows can also do it too. Um, and what we've found in raising cows with goats is it's, it's really funny seeing a, see, seeing a goat and a goat and cow eating the same plant next to each other. They, they, almost, they almost mimic each other in certain things. Um, so I, and her work is built off of uh, Fred Provenza's um, work with animal behavior. So all, all the information and resources is out there. And a lot of times it's just a matter of, 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 of taking that, that leap of trying something different. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, the multi-species grazing. This here, just some pictures of, we, you know, we were raising some Galloway, um, some Galloway uh, steers. And we were, we were raising them with the goats and it was really, it was just really neat to see how, how, you know, how quickly they, they came to accept each other. Um, as you can see this, you know, this goat kid's on this steer's back and it, it's perfectly content. So I, you know, I think we're, we're starting to try to experiment with it more, but I, I do think, you know, there's, there's certain places like New Zealand, Australia, where I've been hearing about it more, but just the concept of, of, of multi-species grazing um, or flirts, you know, sheep, goats, cows, um, as, as something that's really uh, possible. Next slide. Okay, so now, now I'm gonna dive into what, what the heck we do uh, for a living. And so I, I guess I wanna preface this with, you know, when my wife and I got married, our, our goal was to try to figure out how to make a living with the land base that we have. And so our, our land base, just to put it in perspective, our, our land, the land base that we actually own is 150 acres. And so like on, on, an, you know, on, a, on a grazing scale, that's pretty small. And so we, we found, you know, as small holders, we, like, we, we had to get creative with how, how, do we, how do we make a living with this 150 acre land base? And, and so what, what we stepped into was seeing how, how, you know, how they were doing on our nap lead on our place. Um, and people started asking, you know, could, could you bring the goats to my place to eat weeds or do you, you know, will you hire them out? And, so we, you know, we, we, I contacted some other uh, custom graze, you know, or target grazers um, in, in the West and tried to glean some information. And we kind of just went head first into it. And we, you know, to get our numbers up initially, we, we had to, uh, we, we co-opt. So we, we partner with um, some other producers and we would run goats together. And so 
we were, you know, we were starting off at 250, 500, and then eventually we were managing a herd of um, over a thousand head of goats. And that's, that was the, that was the point where we really realized that getting bigger is not necessarily always better. There, and, and that's where our wife and I really talked about like the quality of life question. Like, is it, is it, is our quality of life more important or is make making more money and running you know an insane amount of goats so we've kind of settled back down on about 500 head is is about perfect for our our grazing needs and th this is a picture of our context um we you know our place is we're we're just 15 minutes outside of red lodge um but red lodge is a ski town uh brewery town tourist town and it's 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 slowly getting more and more subdivisions. This is actually a golf course subdivision. And what we found is goats are really, really incredible and versatile in being able to, to move through these landscapes. So we are literally crossing a major intersection here. This is 78, which is considered a, a, a highway. And we're going into this golf course community, which is manicured lawns and you know sprinklers and in golf course and we're grazing some vacant land on a slope above the brewery and early on the city cops uh like they were they were all over all over us like hornets um like what are you doing you can't do this and we start the county sheriff was working with us and then i i started looking into the laws of it and started asking in in montana we have we have a legal right to we have the right of way and we have the legal right to move livestock on any public road as long as you have a flagger in the front and the back and this is an old law and i think it's part of what makes montana you know unique in the sense of we we were built on moving livestock and and goats are more and newer and that, that was something i kind of missed in the history but um, goats have, you know, are more recent in Montana. I mean, t historically it was sheep and cattle. And um, somewhere along the way, the wool market with sheep um, kind of put the goat in the back, you know, the backyard and became kind of the poor man's animal. Um, but now we're finding, you know, there's, there's a lot of ethnic demand for the meat. And so goats are becoming more popular. Um, but we have, there's a herding dog here in the corner. This is this is our, our main border collie. And so I we found that herding dogs are essential. You got to have a good herding dog. And you also you also have to learn how to work with that dog um, in order to move these goats. Next slide. Um, so it was mentioned earlier, but one of our first jobs we were doing um, was with BLM um, on a, it was an island project. It was a it was a 60 acre island on the Clarks Fork River. And we were grazing leafy spurge, which was blooming at the same time that high water was occurring. And so we had to figure out, well, how the heck do you get goats to the island? So we were trying to, to, to hog tie them. And you can see that raft in the background there and try to pile them up in the raft and ship them, ship them across the river. And that was a total catastrophe. And so we figured out, we kind of made a makeshift shoot. And then over the years, we got better at this, um, where we literally have a shoot over a cut bank and we just run them single file into the river. And this, this is where we first really learned that goats in particular hate water. They, they do not like to cross water unless they're really forced to. And we also learned that not all goat breeds are the same. Um, as you can see here in the picture, this is kind of your more typical boar goat, which has become like the popular um, meat goat breed, which is from, you know, originally from South Africa. Um, we also are running some Angora goats in this group. And we learned that Angora goats, when as soon as they got in the river, they would just go into paralysis and they would sink to the bottom and die. And, and the, you know, the boar goats, as I'll touch, touch later on in a little bit in this talk, the, the boar goats were um they're not made for montana winters and so we started selecting for more uh cashmere genetics and um but so i'm, I'm just sharing this picture of it isn't it there's so much creative potential with what where you can graze and what you can do with these animals um and you know i guess 
to just touch on t- touch on you know the the service industry the payment side uh we we have never we the only ones we have had to do contract like co- written contracts with is government agencies all like currently we're we're just working with private landowners and we've We've just found that we just do hand, a handshake and a verbal agreement. Um, but in in this in this situation, um, this you know this was about like a, a six thousand dollar project to to graze to graze this island. So from from a grazing standpoint for us, this this was a this was a really big deal to get paid to 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 graze. And so this was one of the first projects that really helped us. Um, yeah, that's fine. So this picture, this picture here, um, is another place that we graze. And, um, as you can see, the, the goats, uh, are crossing this bridge and if they're given a chance, they would much rather cross the bridge. Um, there's a reason there's the Billy goats gruff story with the troll under the bridge. They would rather get eaten by a troll than try to cross a river. Um, so, so when possible, we do try to cross bridges or even put a plank across an irrigation ditch and they'll go single file. Um, next slide. Okay, so th- this, is, this is kind of a more current context. Um, this is actually a, a mountain subdivision. You, you can't really see the homes, but it's about you know 20 acre, 40 acre parcels in a home. And there's this riparian area going down the middle and the homeowners association contacted us because they were having they were having a guy go in there with a backpack sprayer and trying to spray certain weeds and he was getting all into all kinds of mad and this this is like goat paradise like the the the, br- the brush the the forest um all the diversity um and so in this scenario, the landowners were, were actually really, really happy to, um, to have the, these aspens thinned out. And so you can see like there's all these young aspen trees that the goats have basically, you know, stripped or killed. And, you know, in some, in, in the South, the, the concept has been called savanna grazing, but, you know, where you graze within a forest and it starts opening up and the more mature trees develop. So we're starting to, we've been grazing in here about for about four years. And um, you can also see there's, you know, there's, there's some bro- smooth brome grass, but you can see how the goats mowed it and trampled. And so we're, we're really learning like that the incredible importance in this aspect of trampling um, for, bu- for building up s- soil cover and then for stimulating your perennial plants to, to grow more. Um, and th- in this situation, you know, it, and I'm, I'm guess I'm gonna touch on it. So, get the you know getting paid to graze is is a concept that I think I think we I think we need to step into as um, regenerative ag producers because the commodity market is you know it, it it's a hard we also participate participate in the hard commodity market and we find that it's it's a hard market to really really depend upon. Um, but I think if if we if we step into this role of seeing our animals and our, our our herd as a tool for land management and for 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 health, um, you know there there's a lot of there there's a lot of pride and there's a lot of motivation that comes with getting paid. Um, and so in, in this in this scenario, you know we're we're getting paid by the by the day, um, and th- that price the the price that we charge depends on on how much. You know how much work it is to to graze. Some areas are really steep, and some areas are more open. And so I'll talk about that a little more um, later. But we we'll go to the next slide. Um, you know, here's here's just and, and anybody who's had goats, you know, this is this is a pretty common occurrence. If you keep them in one area for a certain length of time, they will strip every single bush and and plant in that in that paddock or in that area. And this this is actually a property we were getting hired um, to graze to try to to try to graze out the poison hemlock um, that was killing their horses. And what's what what I at first I was nervous that the goats weren't gonna you know weren't gonna be able to handle eating poison hemlock. Um, but we found we didn't have any issues. Um, and 
And I think part of it too is the scale. I mean, we're, we're you know, we're running in this specific property, we're running about 500 head of mature goats. And so, you know, the, the amount of poison hemlock that each goat's eating is, you know, probably not that much. Um, another situation like this where we got, we've gotten hired is to go in and graze a uh, tall larkspur. Three pounds of tall larkspur can kill a grown cow. Um, and what they're learning is some cows, it's not poisonous to, and some cows it is. Um, but we would go in and graze the, the larkspur, try to leave, goats will eat the grass, but we'll try to leave some of the grass and then they'd bring the cows in and, and graze it again. Um, and that was preventing a lot of death loss. So there's, there's just different, different ways in which these goats can be used. Um, next slide. Yeah. And so, oh yeah. So in the, the, that past picture, um, wait, could you go back real quick, Angel? Oh, sorry. Okay, I, this this is ele this is electric uh, netting. Um, we we end up using a lot of this electric netting on these subdivision properties because we find that it's really um, it, it's it's the most secure way we've found to contain these goats. Um, we it's electrified, so we use a we use a solar and we have an eighty watt solar panel and a deep cycle battery and a little energizer and um that you know the big thing with goats that i found we have horses too and horse horses once they learn something's electrified you can turn it off for a couple of weeks and they won't push their touch on it goats i mean we call them suicide goats because there's always a goat that's testing the fence and so if that fence is off for more than a day somebody's gonna have their head in that netting and get all tangled and strangled and so what we found is really key is you gotta have enough enough electricity a big enough energizer to keep that fence hot. Um, in other, in other contexts, like there, there are, you know, there are producers that are using two strands um, of electric. Daniel Migalski, who is also, I also saw is on this talk. He's, he's using two strands of um, electric polywire. Um, so the netting is just something we've, we've found um, is the most secure. It's, it's labor. It can be labor intensive. Um, but again, if you're, you know, if you're getting paid to graze, then it's part of the, the tool in the toolbox. Um, so ne next slide. So in some cases, um, we, we do a lot of herding, um, in, in certain areas. This, this is a, uh, this is an area, a property up near the ski resort and, um, we're grazing for napweed in here and we, it's just impossible, it's impossible to fence. And so if, if anyone has ever heard it before, it's, I mean, it's your concept of time, your concept of daytime, just, you have to utterly like change that concept because you, you have to work with, with the pace of these animals. Um, there's a really, there's a really neat book that was put out. Um, it's called the art and science of shepherding. And, you know, so his, historically in our, in our area, we, we had sheep herders that would, bring sheep up into the Beartooth Plateau. And, you know, as a kid, as a kid, I remember, you know, there's kind of the stereotype of a sheep herder kind of being a, a you know, a, a drunk loner um, bachelor out, out there with the sheep. But what, what they've really emphasized with uh, this art and science of shepherding book is this concept that like, that, that actually shepherding or herding um, is a science. And we've, we've really learned that too. And how, how you move these animals through these landscapes, how you graze them, where you, how you night pin them. Um, and, but we, we found that herding, herding is very demanding. Um, and we, like my wife and I, in particular, we've never, you know, there is, you know, there is H2A uh, herder programs where they bring in Peruvian herders or, or Hispanic herders. And we we have chosen to 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 do it all, you know, do the herding ourselves. And but we also um, we also have hired people, um, local people, college kids. We've we've done an internship. We do an internship program um, where if they they work through one month of you know boot camp with goats, then we'll hire them on as a as a herder. Um, but we found that you know herding is is really it, it really takes a certain psychological relationship to be able to do it on a daily basis. 
Um, some people can go crazy being out there all day, but we, we ultimately enjoy it. Next slide. Um, you know, guard dogs, uh, I just, I thought I'd sh share this, um, specifically, um, the, you know, these relationships. So, you know, you got a herding dog, which I, I really emphasize. And then we've got guard dogs. Um, we, we like to always have at least, at least two, two guard dogs with, with the herd. And we've, uh, we found that they're, they're really, they're really key to, um, protecting from predators. And to give you an example, we were grazing in a subdivision um, just outside of Red Lodge. Uh, and the, um, the homeowners were complaining about our guard dogs barking at night and, and they were keeping people up. And so we said, okay, we'll pull these guard dogs out. So the next, I, I did, I just, the, the next morning I, I went out to where these goat, the goats had bedded down goats and sheep they'll, they'll bed down they like to bed down on hillsides or up high typically and and i, I happened to stumble across a, an ear uh with a goat ear with an ear tag and i was like oh what the heck is this and found a little bit of crushed up bone so that night we we night penned them by our rv we were we were camped out um we camped out with the herd and we, we were right next to um they were right next to us and we had our herding dog underneath the rv we didn't hear his peep all morning. And I woke up at, you know, crack of dawn. I looked out there and there was a goat laying dead on the fence. And, and I went over and I thought, oh man, that goat must've gotten tangled in the netting. And it, it had two puncture marks on his throat. And uh, it was a um, fish and game came out and they're like, yeah, that was a mountain lion. And so I just share that story in the sense of like, when you're not watching, these dogs are watching. And we've tried burrows, we've tried llamas, we've, We've tried different things and I, I, I think there's nothing like dogs with teeth and bark. Um, so for small ruminants, for sheep and goats, I, I highly recommend guard dogs. They're, they're a key part of um, keeping predators and predators don't, predators are no longer a problem when if you have good guard dogs. Without guard dogs, you're, you're constantly going out and dealing with predators. Um, next slide. Yeah, and then there's kidding season. So there is, um, there are, there are some, some grazers out there. Um, Lonnie Malberg is one of them out of Colorado. She, she really, she really, uh, I would, I would credit her with starting this, the concept of, um, getting paid to graze for weeds. I mean, she, she early on started with the concept of, uh, a, a dollar a day per head, um, was kind of the going rate was, was, was the, the basis. And, the but she she or last I heard she was running um she was running a a a, a herd of non-breeding goats and in our in our scenario we we breed the goats because we find the goat kids are an added um an added component you know an added profit for us and but with with breeding goats I mean the 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 management of these goat kids can be a huge, a huge learning curve um, because it, you know, it, it can be utter chaos at times. I mean, there's concepts of uh, grannying where one, one goat will try to try to adopt, you know, one old doe will try to adopt a bunch of kids around her. Um, and you're pretty soon, you don't know whose kid is whose. And so we, over the years, we've been trying to do like an abbreviated form of um, range kidding. We, we birth out in the pasture and then we do a lot of small paddocks and we are constantly moving the, moving the, the does that haven't given birth into a fresh field every day and the ones that have with, with kids, letting them nest and stay. And then if there's any trouble that we can catch, then we, 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 we end up doing a lot of roping. We'll rope them and, and bring them in. I have a cage in the, on a little trailer in the back of my four wheel, I'll rope them, throw them in a cage and bring them into the kidding barn. And we have jugs in there. Um, so that part can be a little labor intensive sheep, sheep. You can take a lamb and you can oftentimes lead it into a barn or jug. Um, with goats, I found that you can try that. If it's a really good goat, it'll follow you with its kid. But most of the goats have such a flight response. They'll want to run back to the herd. And so we found, um, we found that roping is really, really key. And, you know, in Texas and stuff, they have goat roping events. So 
it's a great opportunity to get good at roping. It's fun um, and useful, um, specifically for goats. So for our model, we find that goat kids are an important kind of part. So the goat kids help pay for our, our hay. Um, and we've we've tried to get away from hay. Jim Garrish's book, Kick the Hay Habit, led us on a, a pilgrimage kind of to different ranches throughout the state to try to graze all winter and and not not have to feed hay. But we finally eventually returned to our our our, our property and you know, we found that, you know, at minimum, we have to feed for at least three months and some years, five months. So it, it gets, um, it gets costly. And we also put hay up on our place. Um, we hire a guy to, to custom bale. And we've really been learning that with goats in particular, like it's, it's great to have napweed. It's great to have thistle in your hay because come wintertime, they're, they're, you know, they're loving, they're seeking out those specific weeds in the hay. So we try to get weedy hay if we can, um, which oftentimes is easier to, is, it can be easy to find. Um, next slide. Um, just, just to touch on, you know, the, you know, go, goats, goats in particular and sheep, you know, there can be some major challenges. Um, th this, this is a picture, you know, we try to bed them down in uh, the willows in the winter time. There's, there's over, there's over 250 goats in this picture. Um, and most of the goats are buried under this snow drift. And I went out there and I thought, oh man, they're going to be dead. You know, and I started pulling them out and they had somehow been moving their heads enough that they, they survived. But we've, you know, we've had train wrecks with pile ups with wind. Um, there's, there's a lot of challenges with goats. Next question. Um, uh, and I'm, I guess I'm looking at the time and maybe I'll, I'll speed up a little bit here. Um, some really specific things with, with parasites um, that we've learned from goats. Um, goats are more susceptible to parasites uh, than, than any other domesticated creature that we've, we've come to know. Um, unlike sheep and cattle, like goats do not develop age-related immunity. Um, what, what we've learned is like this is part of their their biology, they, they want, they want to constantly be browsing. They don't want to eat at dirt level and they want to constantly be moving. Um, uh, you know, so the, the parasites really ultimately have taught us like how to manage goats. Um, and we, we don't deworm. Uh, we don't, we don't vaccinate early on. We were vaccinating. Um, we were deworming and we found that with good, with good nutrition, um, goats, goats can manage, manage, uh, disease and parasites better than any vaccine results we were getting. Next slide. Um, this is a concept that has been coined out there, but this concept of ecological literacy, um, I, you know, so in, you know, in assessing a property, you know, we, we get calls about, Hey, I got this, this, this weed, or I got this bad plant, you know, can you can you help manage it? And um, what what we've really come to learn is, you know, when you go and look at a field or go look at a property, like the the, the flowers or the weeds or what's growing there really indicates a lot of the story of that place. Um, this is a dock plant, for instance, and it's it's really it's it's neat because it it's usually showing like water saturated um, soil, and so I, I like this term of ecological literacy, but like really really like learning learning how to look at a field look at a landscape and read it like you would read a book and and it you know i would say any any good farmer any good rancher like knows it's you know no, knows it's better pastures than it's it's weaker pastures and or, or better fields than it's other fields and, and there's a form of literacy that is occurring there um that there's you know again there's something that should always be blooming um there's all these relationships that are going on. This little beetle with a flower, for instance. Um, there's there's all these relationships going on that baffle me. And I think the more you start seeing and learning them, it's pretty profound. Next next slide. Um, so just just to really go back to this, like really trying to promote grazing as a as a as a service. 
Um, and, and I recognize that not everybody lives in a community that um, has second homeowners and subdivisions and um, wealthy landowners that don't raise livestock. Um, but I do, I do think that we, that we, we really need, we really need to change, start changing our, um, our mindsets and seeing what we do if we're, if we're really putting the time in and we're really trying to, to use animals to, to, to change landscapes that we, we need to get paid for this and we need to find ways, um, to empower ourselves in that and, 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 and adding that, that value added component. Um, some of these, some of these examples I just quickly give here of, um, relationship grazing is kind of a, a term my wife and, um, I and some other people have coined of just, well, there's some properties we've been grazing for, um, 10, 12 years. And it's, it's become more than just the weeds. It's become this relationship where they really look forward to the herd showing up to their place. Um, there's, there's a targeted grazing handbook that's available online. Um, tons of information on grazing weeds with sheep and goats. All that information is out there. That book I mentioned, Art and Science of Shepherding. Um, in Europe, specifically in France, the, the government subsidizes a herding school they train people to herd to maintain the open landscape in the Alps. Um, we in the U.S. Our, our government subsidizes chemical companies, and so I, I think I think there's there's room for learning from Europe and being like, well, how can we how can we 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 shift back a little bit into this into into herding as as a tool? Um, there's Transhumans, you know, the, the tradition of humans and animals moving across landscapes. Spain is recognized as an important tradition. They have a festival there. Other countries have festivals. Um, Drovers Road, there's specific roads that have been designated as pathways for moving livestock. And I just want to mention the, the film Sweetgrass. I don't know if some of you have seen it. It's a film about some of the last, the, the family in Big Timber, the last family to bring sheep up into the Beartooth, high, up into the Beartooth Highland and the plateau. And I just, I just want to pose the question of, you know, it, it's, it's filming their last time doing it. And th th does that have to be the story that we tell in Montana? Um, next, next slide. Um, some of the other things that I just, just want to quickly show, this is an event we did in Paradise Valley outside of Livingston. This is an Argentinian asado tradition. We're, we're, we're grilling a whole goat. Goat meat's delicious, lamb meat's delicious, beef is delicious. I think there's there's tremendous wealth in like finding ways to celebrate, eat, cook, share your animals that you raise. Um, next slide. Yeah, these are these are bone flutes. Um, something that I just you know it's really I, it's really interesting. You know, primitive bone flutes. I I, I got into this herding, we were herding up on a ranch outside of Harleton um, and I had, we had just eaten some, some goat shank in, from a crock pot the night before and I took the bone and I just took my pocket knife and I started kind of fiddling around and all of a sudden I was, you know, out, out there and able to make sound and through that I just, you know, started, started making more over the years and um, it's kind of, it's, I guess it struck me because I was looking into it and the oldest, the oldest instrument ever found is a bone flute in a cave in Germany. And it's like 30,000 years old. So um, I'm just sharing that a sense of we, like, like if, you know, if you look back in time, we all, we all, we all have that creative potential to, to make something beautiful or fun out of the animals that we're raising. And so I think it's an important component of, of raising animals is to, you know, whether it's rawhide braiding, um, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of different things that these traditions, horsehair braiding, um, that I think are really neat. Next slide. Okay. This is, this is gonna be my last slide. Um, this is a bentwood willow chair that I made. Um, if you look at the bottom, there's, um, the, the goats, you know, stripped all the bark off, off these saplings and, and, and over the years, what really struck me is all these shoots that started, these willow shoots that started coming up in the, in the willow riparian areas we were grazing in the winter. And, and so 
I, I started experimenting with it and figured out how to make this bent wood willow chair. And all of a sudden I realized like, holy smokes, I got, I got an endless supply of these willows that these goats are stimulating every year. And I had this old, this older lady, um, somehow heard about it and she contacted me from a town over at Zorky and she has this Bentwood heart table that was her, you know, great, great grandfather. It's over 150 years old. Um, and he was like a sheep herder and he made it for his wife and it's been passed down through the years. And so I looked into this and it's, you know, it's an older, it's an older tradition, but again, it's, it's this tradition of taking something from the landscape and that is in relationship to the animals that you're grazing and, and making it beautiful. Um, and so I, I just want, I just want to share that because in the end, I think like in order for us to, to maintain raising this goats, it has to be more than just cognitive reality of just moving animals from one paddock to another. Like there has, for us, there has to be a little bit more than just that to sustain this as a life way. So yeah, thank you for listening, everybody. Um, look forward to hearing your voices and questions. And I think I had, we have two questions, I guess, in the end for the breakout group. I'll let yeah. Angel and Haley do it. Absolutely, Ivan. So I'm gonna drop the two questions that we've got right now into chat. And these are questions that Ivan had posed to the group. And so the first one is, have you ever encountered a plant that has challenged you or made you wonder why it was growing there? The next time you encounter this plant, how can you view it in a different way? And then the other topic is, have you ever encountered a plant? Oh, nope, that is the same question again. So let me grab the other one for you. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to put you into two breakout or into a 10 minute breakout session where we're going to let you talk amongst yourselves. You're going to be in groups that are a little bit smaller groups. And Ivan is going to be in one of these breakout sessions. And then you can discuss these questions among your group. And once you get those discussed, we'll come back after those 10 minutes. And then you're going to be able to come in and give your answers in the chat and your questions in the chat. And then Ivan and I will kind of do a little Q&A with those. So the other question is, do you see an opportunity to use goats or any other livestock in your community? So with that, Angel's going to break out into some discussion groups. We'll be there for 10 minutes and then we'll bring you back into this main room. Thanks everyone. And now we're going to go ahead and uh, open it up to some of the questions and some of the discussion that you had from your breakout rooms. And so if you can go ahead and put those into your chat, um, into the chat here, then we can start talking about them. So I just got Shiley's totally understandable, uh, she says. But yeah, if you've got any questions for uh, Ivan as we kind of continue on with the discussion questions that you had for your breakout sessions, or if you have anything even on topic that you wanna bring up, that is A-OK. -okay. So a couple of questions here, Ivan, that we had before we broke out into the chats. Um, somebody said, do you know how many pounds per head per day your goats eat when you have them on hay? Do you free feed or limit intake? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so go, so what, one of the other interesting things about goats is they they have, they have higher higher feed requirements than cattle. Um, we've we've found over the years that you know on, on hay um, they they need around roughly like four to four and a half uh, percent of their body weight um, in hay. So just just you know an average doe for us is you know ninety to one hundred pounds. Um, they're smaller creatures than than most of your rambolets or targies. So. So you're, you know, you're looking at four to four and a half pounds of, of hay. Um, I guess we limit it in the sense of we roll, we'll, we'll roll out a round bale or we'll, we'll flake out hay um, and only so much for, for that amount of goats. We, we try not to give them um, too much excess, um, except in situations where um, if we're able to graze, if we're able, a key thing that I recommend to everybody, and maybe a lot of you already know this, but if, if you are feeding hay, if you can feed the hay out on, um, on slopes or areas that um, would benefit from building up litter um, and, and having, having all that poop and pee, um, we found it's a, a great way to transition out of, out of cheat grass 
um, out of nap weed is just winter feeding on it. And within two to three years, you're going to see, you see tremendous change versus just grazing. I mean, we're, we're finding from just grazing it, it, it takes upwards of 10 years to really see major changes, um, for some places. So that, so that's a, it's a great, hay can be a great tool. Um, but yeah, the cows, cows are typically less percentage of their body weight, so it can cost more to feed a goat. So another question here, Ivan, is how are you getting the goats trained to the hot wire fencing? And what do you do about the fence crawlers? Well, yeah. Um, well, fence crawlers are great for barbecuing. Um, that that picture, that one on the, the iron cross over the coals, that was a fence crawler. <laughs> uh, so I, I, find, I find there's always one or two that are really... Uh, just really smart and just always testing the fence and you want to, you want to get rid of those. Um, but you can keep them if you are willing to deal with that frustration. Uh, training them is, is as simple as just put, put setting up a netting or poly wire, whatever you, whatever you got going. I mean, sometimes if you can set up within a paddock that's already has woven wire or a corral, um, and making sure it's hot, get a, get a, get a tester. And, um, we try to make sure that that fence is, you know, put, put out the max, max jewels that of electricity that can, and, um, they're going to, they're going to maybe bust through it the first time. And so that's where you got to have, have someone be ready to turn it off and then chase them back in, put your fence back up. And after a few, you know, after a few hours of doing that, you'll, you'll start getting them trained. And then it just, from there, it's just, just keeping an eye on them and managing them and um, being, you know, being willing to, to, to deal with some, some chaos at times, but eventually you'll get them pretty stabilized. Well, speaking of chaos, one of the groups had a discussion about having goats in big country and they had a chat about tracking potentially lost sheep or goat herds by adding trackers to the guard dog collars and assuming that the dogs stay with the livestock. Is that something you've experienced? Um, yeah, we've, well, so I see Trevor Smith there and Amber. Hi guys. <laughs> um, we, we ran goats up on their place outside of uh, Cohagen and then um, we run goats over uh, near Harleton on, on a big ranch there and we, we, we tried that. We, we had a GPS tracking collar and we would, we, we actually put it on a lead goat and then we'd also put it on a guard dog. And what was really dumbfounding was certain times the herd would split into like two groups or, you know, even three groups and the dogs happened just to be with the one group. But what, what we did learn, what we did learn over the years was a really good guard dog will go go back and find the other group. And, and so, so I, I, I would almost recommend if, if you have two guard dogs, if you have one dog that sticks with the, the herd more and you have one that roams more to, to have collars on both those dogs, because then you might be able to find where that other group of goats is. Um, but ultimately like it, there's, I, I'd say there's an aspect of herders intuition where you just, you can't, you know, when you got five, 200, 500,000 animals, it's really hard to count them all. And so there's a certain aspect of, you just have to have the intuition of like, do I have everybody? And, you know, you start looking for there's key animals that you recognize. Um, and sometimes you just get damn lucky. And, you know, in, in one situation over in where Trevor and Amber Smith are within, within one afternoon, the, the goats went over nine miles, they booked it to Cohagen because the wind was blowing hard. And uh, I had no idea they were going there. And Trevor and Amber were coming back from town. They're like, Ivan, your goats are on the road. So, and sometimes you, you just got to get lucky and hope that you got good ranch neighbors are going to let you know if they're wandering way, way the hell out there. But um, typically it's, it's best to try to have someone out with the goats herding um, most of the day is my recommendation. Well, we've got uh, three questions here that kind of go in conjunction with one another. One is how old is your kid crop when you head out for grazing projects? Another one is what month or months do you choose to birth them? And then how do you market the kids as well as the goats? Yeah, good questions. Um, 
So, uh, well, so we, 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 we try to start, it's called kidding, which is a funny term, but it's called kidding birthing. Um, we try to, we try to have breed them. They have a five month gestation. We try to breed them for about the second week of May for, for our, our area. That's when the grass is really starting to green up. Um, the first two weeks of May are typically cold, wet rain, snow, um, goats are, really prone to hypothermia um they they're born they're so little when they're born and so if they get cold and wet their their energy just declines tremendously um and we were birthing in march uh before but we had to rely a lot more upon um having a barn having a, a facility and what we found is the goats the, the goat kids got to the same weight by November and December, as they did being born in March or May. And so in our situation, we've learned that goats do not gain very fast when it's cold. They, they, gain, they gain the most during growing season and when it's warm. You can put a whole bunch of feed and grain in a goat, and if it's cold out, they're not going to gain much. Um, and that's a really frustrating thing about goats if you're trying to put gain on them. And so, so that, so we, so we're typically, um, by, by June, by June 20th, um, we're, we're starting to move. Um, and we've prioritized kidding that much later and we've no longer doing like the leafy spurge projects into May, early June. We just found the amount of money we make from the kids is worth more than what we would make grazing at that time. So we've kind of just switched. So we're grazing, starting grazing around June 20th for the paid grazing. And we found that we can only go about five miles the first, um, the, the first move. And that was something I forgot to mention, but we, we, we have created a, a circuit where we walk the goats to every property within the county. And we know we used to use semi trucks, we used to use trailers, and we've been able to create a whole circuit where we can walk them. The most will go is 12 to 13 miles in a morning. Goats average about three miles per hour. Um, so, you know, depending on where you are, it can be a pretty good clip. But when they're young, it's really hard to go more than five miles. And you got to take breaks along the way. And the old sheep producers have told me when they were trailing sheep up to the mountains, they would just leave lambs behind that couldn't keep up. Um, in our case, we try to have a truck with a cage um, so that we can throw any stragglers in there um, that aren't keeping up. But the first moves are always hard. Moving goat kids is um, like trying to trying to move a flock of fish in the in the sea it can be really hard. And then, how about the marketing for them, Ivan? Uh, marketing, yeah. Well, I don't know if I'm very good at the mar the marketing of the animals. Um, we just we just literally try to uh, get them to about 50 pounds, uh, 50, 55 pounds. And then we, we sell them at pays and billings, um, the public auction yards. And um, as everybody knows who participates in the commodity market, you know, the prices can fluctuate, but on average over the past 10 years, goats, goat kids have maintained a higher price per pound than, than lamb or, or beef. And so that's kind of a selling point for some people on why they want to raise goats is, is to catch that higher market. Um, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to step into um, doing more, um, doing more like goat barbecue and getting people to eat goat meat because I keep hearing about how there's such an ethnic demand for the goat. And I'm like, well, why, well, why is there such an ethnic demand? Well, they're linked into these holidays religious holidays when they eat goat. Goat meat is the number one consumed red meat globally. So there's like globally, there's a lot of different countries that have attrition eating goat. But in the US, um, the number one meat eaten that I've learned that I learned statistically is boneless, skinless chicken breast. So there's there's a huge need for getting people to experience and try um try meat that's raised so we're, we're trying to start doing hosting more events where we're going to barbecue whole goats and um serve it you know as as part of the experience 
but I, I, you know, I don't foresee that. I don't foresee being able to, you know, barbecue two, 300 goat kids. So that's just a little drop in the bucket. All right, there's two more questions out there for Ivan and then we'll uh, call her a night here. It's just after 8.30. Uh, this one's from Patty Armbrister in Hinsdale. She asks, uh, of course, you talked about the, the fungi and the bacteria ratios in the fields before the grazing, but have you ever checked those ratios after the knapweed has been reduced? Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Patty. Um, no, I I haven't. I I guess I I just after I learned that it was it was fungally dominated, um, I I kind of put my hands up in the air and said, well, as long as the goats as long as the goats eat it, then I'm um, just gonna let Mother Nature keep keep doing her thing. Um, but I I I am I am curious. Um, but you know ha I have. You know, I have learned that the alfalfa has that, that, you know, more balanced partnership with bacteria and fungi. Um, but ultimately, I think it just for us, it just really came down to, um, you know, we're, we're raising animals and if, if they eat it, then, then that, that's, that's an A plus in my book. So I, I have yet to find a plant that I can't force a goat to eat. <laughs> and then Cody wants to know how many guard dogs per head would you recommend? Well, it really depends on your guard dog. Uh, you know, there's, there's some dogs that roam. There's some dogs that, that stay put. Um, but I, you know, I, I'd say at least, at least, at least one, I mean, at least, I'm going to say two guard dogs, but I think the partnership is really key. And I would say two guard dogs for any number of goats. Um, if they're good dogs, they will do the job. But you start pushing over 500 goats and you might want more than two guard dogs. Um, but not all guard dogs are the same. Um, you, you really can be a trial and error to see what, and it's, sometimes it's not even the breed. Sometimes it's just the personality of that dog and how it's raised with your stock. We have to have dogs that we can actually catch and handle, but we also want them to stay with the goats. So it's kind of a tricky balance. Um, yeah, but some some guys are running four four guard dogs. I mean, it's a lot to a lot of guard dogs to feed. Um, we I guess just just one little snippet to throw in there. Um, we were feeding dog food uh, for years, and it got expensive and. We started connecting with the, a butcher, um, the packing plant, and the, there's an amazing amount of beef trimmings that are thrown away every day. And we we started, we just, we have two separate chest freezers. We figured the electricity cost to run those chest freezers is cheaper than buying dog food. So we just, we found that we just feed them straight trimmings and it's typically free and the butcher's happy to give them to you and um, the dogs do better on it than dog food. So again, you know, if, if, if you're, if I, I've never taken ranching for ranching for profit school, but just that concept of profit, as far as I understand is minimizing your costs. So the more you can minimize your costs, like it's probably going to help you out in the long run. Any public goat barbecue is planned for this summer. You've intrigued some folks that want to come visit. It sounds like. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're gonna. Um, I think we're we're trying to we're, we're we're gonna try to figure out some some dates and um, we'll probably post them on our website or I could um, I could let Haley and Angel know and Ranchers Alliance. Um, we are hosting a woman. It's, it's more my wife. Uh, but we're hosting a woman in ranching um, gathering in end of September. Um, they're a great organization too. So if, if you're a woman, I guess the men, sorry about that, but for the women, if you <laughs> wanted to participate in that, we'll, we'll, we, I think we, we might be barbecuing a goat then. So, um, but we have been doing butchering workshops, uh, like the art of butchering um, and utilizing the whole animal. So um, we're going to try to post, post that. Awesome. And then I've got one last question here and they wanted to know if you had any book recommendations for learning about the benefits of different quote unquote weed species, adding that they are frequently annoyed by the reductionist view of noxious weeds serving no ecological purposes. Hmm. 
Yeah. Good question. Well, there's, there's a, I mean, if you want to get it like on a soil mineral, like what the weeds are doing, um, there's a book called When Weeds Talk. Um, some farmers put together and specifically show all the specific things that weeds are drawing up, what minerals, what they're doing. Um, ultimately, like I, I just, I just really, I, you know, really like off the top of my head, there's not a specific book so much as um, just your own observation. Just, you know, spend some time, go, go out there and, you know, spend some time with these plants and watch your animals around them. What are they doing around them? Um, what do they smell like? Dig one up. Um, oftentimes, like, like that story I told about my, my neighbor, you know, in the, in the Great Depression, they didn't have books back then. Um, they just observed. And so I think every one of us in this chat is intelligent enough to go just spend some time out there and figure out what the hell are these plants doing and can I, can I better utilize them? In that group discussion, someone brought up uh, Schneider, the Schneider couple brought up uh, wormwood. And I was, I was telling them how in, in health food dog stores, they sell powdered wormwood, you know, for deworming your cats and dogs. So you guys, all you guys who have wormwood on your ranch, you start drying it and powdering it and you can make some extra money. I mean, there's all these, you know, different things out there. And now I'm fibbing because I'm just going to drop one last question. I think this is one that a lot of folks probably have. It's coming from Shiley. And she says she's always concerned about her goats getting out and eating the neighbor's landscaping, pine trees, et cetera. Have you had that happen much? She says, I know they have a healthy respect for electric fences, but there are those escape artists. So it worries me when people ask about grazing my goats on their property. So, so far, that's been the reluctance that's kept her from it. Um. Yeah, that's that can become a huge a huge uh, issue. Um, we we specifically like haven't had a lot of issues with that because we always try to have someone present. So there's we always we always try to have a presence of someone's around, someone's there if the goats do bust out. That's part of getting paid. Um, is we have to like we we kind of loop that into the equation. Um, but I have a friend in Gallatin Gateway outside of Bozeman. He's got a small herd of goats. And I mean, he's literally, he's had, he's had his goats get into the, this homeowner's neighborhood and they've called the police on him multiple times and had a sheriff show up over the goats getting into their, their trees. So I would highly recommend figuring out a way to keep your goats from eating your neighbor's trees because it can very quickly create like a war zone. Um, and they will, goats love pine trees they love every tree and so if they have an opportunity they will so shock the heck out of them um if you can and and i and I, you know i've even heard of guys using uh using paintball guns to you know to if you got a major escape artist um have your have your teenage neighborhood kid or ranch kid or whoever lay out there in the bushes and and get it with a paintball gun and that'll quickly teach it to you know to stop getting out um <laughs> little, 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 little tricks like that, that, you know, you just got to get creative if you can't be there all the time. All right. Well, Ivan, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're going to go ahead and call it an evening. We will be putting this up on our RSA YouTube channel. And uh, so you can rewatch this later on. We just dropped that link into our chat. Ivan's website is there in the chat as well, creatinghealthymeadows.com. And then also there is a link to a post-event survey. We'd love to hear how we did, how our presenter did. We're always looking to improve these as well as making sure that we're covering topics that you want us to cover. So please fill out the event survey. It's very, very brief and let us know how you felt about tonight's event. So Ivan, thank you very much for joining us. Obviously a, a great uh, well attended webinar tonight and we appreciate your time yeah th thanks everyone I, I i'd love to meet all in person maybe we could circle up around some barbecue goat and until <laughs> until then and enjoy whatever you guys are doing out there and do the best at it have a good evening thanks ivan bye everyone